We're now producing about 135 million pounds from primary mine supply, and that's in the backdrop of well over 190 million pounds of annual demand and reactor requirements. Welcome to Proven Improbable, where we deliver mining insights and bullion sales in the form of physical delivery, offshore depositories, and private blockchain distributed ledger technology. Welcome to Proven Improbable. I'm your host, Maurice Jackson. And joining us for a conversation is Jordan Trimble, the President, Director, and CEO of Sky Harbor Resources. Mr. Trimble, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for having me again. Glad to have you on the program to discuss Sky Harbor Resources, a preeminent uranium explorer in Canada's Athabasca Basin. Members of our audience should note that we conducted a very thorough, comprehensive interview regarding the value proposition of Sky Harbor Resources in August. We encourage you to watch that interview to fully appreciate today's interview. Mr. Trimble, please introduce us to Sky Harbor Resources and the opportunity the company presents to the market. So for those that uh, haven't uh, had a chance to listen to the first interview, just a quick high level on the company. We are a high-grade uranium exploration and early stage development company with projects in the Athabasca Basin in northern Saskatchewan, again, the highest grade depository of uranium in the world. We, we've done a good job over the last five or six years of acquiring these projects at attractive valuations in a depressed uh, uranium market. And so we have uh, six projects scattered throughout the basin on the, on the west side uh, near recent notable discoveries uh, made by NextGen and Fission, as well as uh, projects over on the east side where you have uh, infrastructure uh, and uh, the, uh, the largest and richest uranium mines uh, in the world uh, being at uh, MacArthur River and Cigar Lake. Uh, our flagship project uh, is a project called Moore. Uh, Moore Lake is a project we acquired about three years ago from our largest shareholder and strategic partner, Denison Mines. We've been actively exploring uh, and advancing that project, uh, making some uh, recent notable uh, discoveries. We uh, are now preparing for a winter drill program. We'll talk a little bit more about that. That's a big upcoming catalyst for the company. And then in addition to offering that high-grade discovery potential, really looking to emulate the recent, again, successes at the next gen's fissions, Hathors of the world, uh, we also act as a prospect generator. And uh, we look to bring in partner companies to advance our other projects. Uh, notably, we've done two deals uh, in the last several years, one of which with France's largest uranium mining company uh, known as Arano, previously uh, called Ariva, uh, where they uh, can spend upwards of $8 million to earn up to 70% uh, of our, our Preston project, and then another company uh, we did a deal with a few years back called Azincourt. Uh, they spend three and a half million, turn up to 70% uh, of our East Preston project. So a good complement uh, to what we're doing at our flagship. Uh, these, these partner companies fund the work. Uh, we get some cash payments from them, and we also benefit from news flow. So uh, that's the company in a nutshell run by myself, uh, my team here in uh, Vancouver, and my uh, head geologist uh, and the director of the company, Rick Kazmersky, uh, and our geological team in Saskatoon. Uh, and uh, some notables on the board and advisory board, uh, David Cates, who's the president and CEO of Denison Mines, again, our largest shareholder strategic partner, uh, and uh, another gentleman, Paul Matizic, a strategic advisor to the company. Uh, so a good uh, technical team and management team and a strong shareholder base as well. To gain some better context and appreciation for Sky Harbor's most recent press release, Mr. Trimble, where in the Athabasca is the flagship Moore Lake project located and how many hectares does it contain? Yeah, so it's a big property. It's about 36,000 hectares. Uh, it's located on the east side of the Athabasca Basin, so just south of MacArthur River. It's actually located about 12, 13 kilometers uh, east of uh, Denison's flagship project, the Wheeler Project. So the, the road that goes up to MacArthur River uh, is actually in between their project and our project. So logistically, for us, uh, especially in the winter, it's very easy to get in and out. The main Maverick corridor where most of the drilling's focused uh, is very easy to work on. Your drill costs come, come down quite a bit. Um, and so ideally located or situated on the east side where the infrastructure is power roads, existing mines and mills. Uh, and that's an important part uh, of the story here for, for us at our flagship project. 
Jordan, take us to your flagship Moore Lake project, which is known for its rich, high-grade uranium, and let's discuss the details of the company's latest press release regarding airborne geophysics surveying and the exciting plans for the upcoming drill program. We just announced uh, about a week ago uh, results from a UAV, uh, a drone mag survey flown by Pioneer Aerial Surveys. And so this is a, a new technique that, that uh, we're using to refine and uh, identify new uh, and existing targets. Uh, at uh, our flagship project, the Moore Lake project. So the, at the project, there's a four-kilometer long uh, structural corridor, mineralized corridor called the Maverick Corridor. Uh, this is where most of the historical exploration and the drilling that we've carried out over the last several years has been focused. There's high-grade uh, mineralized uranium mineralization there, uh, upwards of 21% U308. Uh, there's several high-grade pods along strike uh, on this four-kilometer long corridor, but really only two kilometers of it has been systematically drill tested. So there's room to expand along strike, make additional discoveries. But what's uh, intriguing right now and what's uh, significant for this upcoming drill program is that uh, we are now looking a little bit deeper and drill testing a little bit deeper into the basement rocks. And uh, worth noting, uh, with these recent discoveries that we've talked about, again, next-gen fission, uh, the Griffin deposit uh, that Denison uh, discovered uh, several years back, these are all basement-hosted deposits uh, below the uh, sandstone sediments and uh, the unconformity being the contact. Uh, so finding these feeder zones in the basement rock, that's really where you can find your biggest and highest grade deposits in the Athabasca Basin. And that's what's exciting about this project uh, right now is that uh, using these new techniques, these, these uh, mag surveys uh, flown by drones, we're able to get a more refined geophysical signature, get a better picture of what's happening uh, beneath and uh, properly with pinpoint accuracy target uh, these, uh, these potential feeder zones. So we really believe that we're going after some of our best targets. It's worth noting in the last drill program, which was earlier in the year, one of our last drill holes intersected some of the highest grade mineralization that we found in the basement rock um, on this project to date. Again, relatively untested. Uh, we, re we really think we've just scratched the surface uh, and we think we're on to finding something uh, much larger in these basement rocks. So this, uh, this recent news release, the results from this drone a mag survey, what we found are these cross-cutting structures or features that basically come and break up that main structural corridor and allow the fluids to come up, allow the uranium to come up. So we've identified uh, a couple of uh, top priority targets, one of which is at what we call the East Maverick Zone. This was a new discovery we made a few years ago uh, where we discovered high-grade mineralization along strike from the main Maverick Zone, uh, and we had grades there upwards of 9% uh, over a meter and a half. Uh, uh, in this uh, last drill program, again, one of these last holes that we drilled, uh, we hit, uh, like I said, high grade in the basement rock, uh, but we, we haven't been able to follow up on it yet. So uh, sure enough, we flew the drone survey. Uh, we saw it. We see a target a, a little bit deeper down, and we're going to be drill tapping that uh, in this program coming up. We also have uh, another zone about a kilometer and a half along strike up to the northeast uh, called the Viper Zone. Uh, we'll be drill testing that. And then from a regional perspective, it's a big property. We're going to be going back into an area that's had limited historical drilling called the Otter Zone. And this was a, a zone about nine nine kilometers away actually from that main Maverick corridor uh, that uh, we drilled a couple of holes earlier this year, had anomalous uh, uranium mineralization, uh, but definitely warrants follow-up work. So we'll be doing a little bit of exploratory work and drilling there as well. Let's discuss the forthcoming drill program. Yeah, so it's uh, going to be a winter drill program. We're, we're waiting for freeze-up, so that'll be later this year, early in the new year. Uh, we have planned uh, and budgeted for 2,500 meters of drilling. Um, we'll have details out on this uh, uh, drill program uh, over the next month or two here, so uh, look out for uh, additional news flow on that. We're just going through the final plan right now, but as highlighted in this news release, there's three main target areas. Most of the drilling focused at the Maverick Zone, in particular the Maverick East Zone, and then the Viper Zone, uh, and then a regional target at the Otter Grid. What are some of the potential catalysts on the horizon for shareholders? 
Yeah, so the, the, the big one, uh, needless to say, is this upcoming drill program. You know, one hole can change the, change the fortunes for the company. It can really be a game changer. Um, I think given the current valuation and market cap, uh, you know, one big hole, uh, we can see a significant price increase on that. Again, we're out there looking to make that next big high-grade discovery, continuing to advance uh, our, our flagship project. Uh, so that's a big one. But we also, as I mentioned earlier, acting as a prospect generator, have partner companies uh, that are planning upcoming work programs, specifically Arano uh, at our Preston project. This is adjacent to NextGen's ground uh, and, uh, and Fission as well on the west side of the Athabasca Basin. Uh, they've completed uh, previous drill programs and exploration programs at Preston, uh, and they are now planning for a, an upcoming winter program as well. We'll have details on that program when we get the final plan uh, from them. Uh, and also, Azincourt, this was some news that we had out about a month ago from our partners uh, at Azincourt announcing plans for a 2,500-meter drill program at our East Preston project. So again, these are our partner-funded programs. Uh, collectively, the partner spending upwards of $11.5 million uh, to earn an up to 70% of our Preston and East Preston projects. And both of these programs uh, will uh, provide news flow for Sky Harbor. Uh, again, like I said, we do get some cash payments uh, as per the option earn-in agreements with the partners, uh, and it's a great complement. It adds to the upcoming catalyst that we have at our flagship project more. Uh, and another note I'll just make is we are uh, talking with other companies right now, other groups that are interested in the other projects that we have as a prospect generator. We're always looking to bring in uh, strategic partners, value-add partners uh, to come in and advance our secondary projects. And we have three other projects uh, in, on the east side of the Athabasca Basin in Falcon Point, Man Lake, and Yurchison, uh, all, all three of which are 100% owned. Falcon Point uh, uh, is worth uh, worth noting that there's a, a small resource there, NI-43-101, complete inferred resource, uh, and a very high-grade surface showing uh, on the north end of the property at 68% U-308. So uh, a project that uh, we would like uh, to get back to work to or find a partner company to come in and fund that exploration as we think there's a lot more to be found there. Switching gears, Mr. Trimble, please share the current capital structure for Sky Harbor Resources. So there's uh, 64 million shares issued in outstanding. Uh, I'd say just under half of that uh, is uh, uh, in the hands of several groups, including management and insiders. As I mentioned, Denison Mines is our largest strategic shareholder. Uh, we have a few funds and institutional investors uh, that have come in over the last several years. And when was the last time you purchased shares, and at what price? Uh, it was actually today. I've been buying more shares in the market uh, over the last uh, several weeks. Uh, in the last couple months here, um, just a note on the market, Post Section 232, we have seen a, a sell-off across the board uh, with uranium companies and stocks. There was a, a lot of money uh, or some money that came into the sector about a year ago that drove higher prices. And, and some of that uh, money that came in uh, came in on a trade on this 232. It was event-driven funds and money came in that bid these companies up we, we also saw that in the backdrop of a rising uranium price but we've now had to, we've now seen uh, some of that money some of those funds uh, have to exit the sector uh, and we've seen a sell-off as a result of that so it's you know I think really just a short-term uh, uh, unfortunate sell-off that we're going through again across the board it's I believe a an incredible buying opportunity uh, and uh, the value proposition given that you know we, We've continued to advance our projects. I, I think there's going to be also a move in the uranium price here uh, between now and year end uh, that, that will help uh, drive uh, higher prices. I think the value proposition right now is, is really better than ever given the upcoming catalysts we have and, uh, again, this uranium market recovery. Mr. Trimble, last question. What did I forget to ask? Well, I uh, would like to touch on the uranium market. Uh, it's obviously a big part of our story, uh, and uh, there's a lot uh, to update on since we last spoke. So um, we have seen the uranium price settle in. It's pulled back a little bit uh, earlier in the year, but it has settled in in the mid-20s. Uh, we're still trading 
uh, near historical lows in inflation-adjusted terms. We're trading well below that average global cost of production. We need to see a much higher uranium price uh, for new mines uh, to come online, for existing mines that have been idle to come back online, most notably MacArthur River. So uh, there's a good case, a compelling case for much higher uranium prices given the supply demand. We're now seeing a major supply deficit forming. Uh, I was just at the World Nuclear Association uh, Symposium in London, uh, which is one of the marquee conferences for the nuclear industry and uranium mining industry uh, annually. Um, it's held in London. And uh, it was quite interesting. They came out with their biannual fuel report. And uh, this was, uh, uh, I think, one of the, 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 the key takeaways from the conference is seeing that fuel report uh, really, I think, opened up, uh, opened a lot of people's eyes to, you know, what's happening uh, in, the, in the uranium mining sector right now. You've had major supply curtailments, uh, almost uh, 30% of global primary mine supply that's been either shut down uh, or, uh, or curtailed, uh, including, as I mentioned, MacArthur River uh, in the Athabasca Basin. Um, so you've seen major supply cuts in response uh, to a low commodity price environment. We're now producing about 135 million pounds from primary mine supply, and that's in the backdrop of well over 190 million pounds of annual demand and reactor requirements. And so I think something's got to give that obviously coming from secondary supplies. I think we'll see secondary supplies uh, can continue to dwindle here. Uh, and we're seeing that spot market tightening up. Um, one of the big talking points going forward here uh, in the near term, and I, potentially one of the, the biggest catalysts for any uranium company, uh, is the fact that Cameco, because they've shut down uh, their largest mine at MacArthur River, they have to buy uh, or shore up supply of, uh, of uranium either in the spot market or from other secondary sources to meet, to deliver into the contracts that, that they have with utility companies. Well, we now know that they have to buy quite a bit between now and year end, uh, potentially upwards of 10 million pounds. Uh, and then next year, over 20 million pounds. So that's a lot of material that they have to get uh, either from secondary supplies or what it appears will happen. They'll have to buy uh, some of that, if not all of that, uh, in the spot market over a very short period of time. And, and just to put some, give some perspective on that, a year ago when a lot of these uranium companies, including us, were hitting 52-week highs, uh, it, that was driven by a uranium price increase from the low 20s uh, to about $29 a pound uh, in about a five-month period, and a big part of that uh, was Cameco buying in the spot market, and they bought about 8 million pounds. So here we are today, uh, and Cameco has to buy uh, about 10 million pounds between now uh, and early in the new year. And so this could be uh, the single, one of the single largest catalysts for the spot price uh, over the coming months. And I think if we see that spot price break $30 a pound, we've seen this resistance in the high 20s, uh, but I think if we see it break $30 a pound, I think that is what's going to spur utility buying, contracting to pick up. That, as we talked about in the previous interview, is going to be uh, one of the, the, the more important catalysts coming up over the next few years. But I think they're waiting to see that price move. I think Cameco in the market and, you know, again, potentially utilities uh, that, that are seeing this play out come into the market as well. I think uh, a combination of that, uh, you'll see this price tick up through 30. And as we've seen in the past, again, it's important to note uh, that the combined market capitalization of all publicly traded uranium companies is less than $10 billion. That means that money that comes into the space works its way down to the junior companies like Sky Harbor quite quickly. So we see that uranium price move as we have seen a few times. Uh, in the past several years, we benefit from that quite quickly. Money flows down quickly from the large caps to the small caps in this sector. Mr. Trimble, for someone listening that wants to get more information about Sky Harbor Resources, please share the website address. Yeah, absolutely. So it's www.skyharborltd.com. I'm more than welcome to get in touch with me directly, my office, uh, or you can email me at jtrimble at skyharborltd.com. Sky Harbor Resources trades on the TSXV symbol SYH and on the OTCQB symbol SYHBF. 
Sky Harbor Resources is a sponsor of Proven and Probable. And as a reminder, I'm a licensed representative for Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments, where we offer a number of opportunities to expand your precious metals portfolio from physical delivery, offshore depositories, precious metal IRAs, and private blockchain distributed ledger technology. Call me directly at 855-505-1900. That number again is 855-505-1900. Or you may email maurice at milesfranklin.com. Finally, please subscribe to provenandprobable.com where we provide mining insights and bullion sales. Jordan Trimble of Sky Harbor Resources. Thank you for joining us today on Proven and Probable. The information presented on Proven and Probable is provided for educational and informational purposes only, without any express or implied warranty of any kind, including warranties of accuracy, completeness, or fitness for any particular purpose. The information is not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice, or any other advice. You should not make any financial, investment, or trading decision based on any of the information presented without first undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.